Thank you for downloading from Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Support for this podcast comes from your generous gifts and donations. You can find out more about Ravi Zacharias and the team at www.rzim.org. think that when you get to the gates of heaven, God will say, give me a list of your achievements and we'll see if we'll let you in? What kind of religious ecstatic experiences have you had and we see if you've had enough? Here's a doctrinal exam. Okay, If you get more than 70%, you get in. Question number one, explain the Trinity. You're in trouble already. What does it really take to get through heaven's gates? Today on Just Thinking, our ZIM itinerant team member Michael Ramsden might surprise you with the answer he gives. Stay tuned as he fills in for author and apologist Ravi Zacharias, today on Just Thinking. When you know who you are, it's possible to fulfill your true purpose in life. But with so much work to do at work and home every day, how do you get in touch with your true identity? Today, RZIM European Director Michael Ramsden offers some interesting answers and connections that you might not expect. And now the conclusion of Michael's message, Who Am I? I don't know if any of you are familiar with a guy called Oliver Sacks. He wrote a book called Awakenings, and if you're not into books, it was made into a film with Robert De Niro. But as ever, the book is better than the film. In the book, Awakenings, Oliver Sacks, a professor, a neuro professor of psychology here in the States who originally graduated from Oxford University where, um, where I now live, he says this in his book, all of us have a basic intuitive feeling, he said, that once we were whole and well, at ease, at peace, at home in this world, totally united with the grounds of our being, and that somehow we have lost this primal, happy, innocent state and fallen into our sickness and suffering. We had something of infinite preciousness and beauty, he said, and we lost it. We spend the rest of our lives searching for that which we have lost, hoping one day we will suddenly find it. How do you like that? A hundred years of psychological research, hundreds of billions of dollars spent, we have finally got as far as Genesis chapter (laughs) 3. You and I were created in the image of something which was perfect, God himself. We were made a little lower than him. Some of you may be familiar with a passage in the Bible that says that we were made a little lower than the angels. But the reason why that passage is translated that way is for modesty. That's not what it says. It literally says that we were created slightly lower than God himself because we were made in his image. But that image is now being marred, broken, and distorted through our rebellion and sin against God. So we are now fallen. We had something of infinite preciousness and beauty, and we have lost it. We're aware of what we have lost. We are looking for it, hoping that someday we will find it. It doesn't matter what you do, what you think, or how you feel, you will not be able to change who you are. Jesus comes along and says, let me take who you are, and I can make you something new. You can be born again a second time. You can have a new identity in me. Jesus Christ is the only person in world history who doesn't simply claim to be the substance of his revelation, that he is the subject of what he's come to talk about. He claims to be able to take us and change our very frame of existence. To make us something new in him. Have you ever known that kind of new birth in your life? Do you know what it is to have that new birth? This is the most profound thing that you can possibly imagine. Because literally, Jesus Christ then is the answer. Who he is, is the solution to the problem of who we are. We can become something new in him. You know, when Jesus came into this world, he said that he had come into this world for one single reason. And that was to die for us. Do you know when Jesus went to the cross, just before he went to the cross, do you remember, um, you may have heard the story that he was praying in a garden of Gethsemane and he was sweating blood and tears. You know, we used to think it was impossible to sweat blood and tears until the Nazis did some interesting experiments during their regime and we realized that if you truly terrify someone, it is possible to make them sweat blood. You only sweat blood if you're absolutely terrified. In the city in which I live, we have a memorial um, where we burnt some Christians because there was a time in our city's capital where that was good fun. So it's called the Martyr's Memorial, okay, to celebrate the burning. There were two guys who were burned there called Latimer and Ridley. And as they were being burned alive at the stake, one of them threw his hand into the fire and said words to the effect of, Fear not, Master Ridley, and play the man. For this day we shall light such a flame in England as I trust shall never be put out. 
Do you know where Christians, when they were being fed alive by the Emperor Nero to be eaten by lions, Emperor Nero complained that the Christians that still had faces left on them were smiling. Now why was that? Do you think the Christians were there outside the arena, looking into the arena, going, Ooh, lions! I love lions! You know what? I've always wanted to be eaten by one! How fortuitous that my life should end this way! I'm so happy! Or do you think there were some kind of really weird masochists and they were going, Ooh, pain! I love pain! This is going to be great! Christian history is littered with martyrs who happily died with smiles on their faces. Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane sweating blood and tears at the prospect of his crucifixion. What was he so scared of? Was he sort of, you know, only half a man? It confirms all of our worst suspicions that actually Jesus was maybe slightly more effeminate than we're prepared to admit. And, you know, he just wasn't particularly tough but very sensitive. Was he scared of something that no one else was scared of? When Jesus came into this world and when he went to the cross... He took on into his being everything that had gone wrong in yours and mine. All of the wrong thoughts, all of the harmful experiences, all of the bad things done, he took on into himself. The Bible says he literally became sin for us, that he became a curse for us. It was the idea of becoming a sin for us that struck terror into Jesus Christ's heart. You know, the trouble when we talk about sin is we think of it that it's something that we do. And sin's much more than just something that we do. If I were to ask you a very honest question and say... Those of you who are Christians here, why do you sin? What would you say? Let's not pretend that you don't sin. If I say, why do you do it? And the answer you would say is, to be happy. Have you ever noticed that? Most of us sin because we think it will make us happy. Is that what happens when we sin? You know, sin brings misery, death, bondage, and destruction. And it cuts us off from God. When Jesus Christ became sin on the cross, he took everything that was broken and wrong into this world, into his body. Just before Jesus went to the cross, he took a loaf of bread and he said, This is my body, broken for you. He took all of the brokenness and pain and hurt in this world and all of the judgment that it deserved on into himself so that we don't have to be. He comes to us now, seeks us out and offers us a new life in him, a new birth in and through him. When I was speaking in North America a couple of years ago, I was speaking to an audience a little bit like this one. And at the end, there was a time for Q&A. One guy stood up and he said, Michael, can I convince you out of your faith? Could I persuade you not to be a Christian? It's a very good question, isn't it? I looked at him and I said, you know what? Your question assumes that my Christian faith is a state of mind. Christianity is not a state of mind. It's a state of existence. I can no more deny my second birth through Jesus Christ than I can deny my first birth to my parents. He wrote to us uh, two weeks later saying he'd given his life to Jesus Christ. To become a Christian is not to enter into abstract philosophical speculation and commit yourself to a system of thought. It is not to say you're going to try to have certain religious experiences and maybe even learn to enjoy going to church, which for some people would be a class A miracle all in and of itself. (laughs) It's not even to promise to do good things, be nice to people, and do the best you can, as noble as that may be. To become a Christian is to understand who you are before God, a child of his that has fallen away through rebellion, that is now broken, damaged, and marred. To understand who Christ is, that he is God come to us, who has taken all of that on into himself and paid the price for it and conquered over it, who now comes to us and offers us new life in him. Have you ever received that new life from him? Do you know that identity that comes from the person of Christ? You know, there is certainty in the Christian faith, but it's not the certainty that comes from a theoretical knowledge or experience or doing certain stuff. Non-Christians, sometimes when they hear me speak and I say, you know what, I know I'm going to heaven, think I'm being very arrogant. Because when you claim that you know you're going to heaven, it does sound very arrogant. Who do you think you are, that you're better than everybody else? The reason why you can be sure of going to heaven is not because of anything that you have done, figured out in your own mind, or experiences you have had. Do you really think that when you get to the gates of heaven, God will say, give me a list of your achievements and we'll see if we'll let you in? What kind of religious ecstatic experiences have you had and we see if you've had enough? Here's a doctrinal exam. If you get more than 70%, you get in. Question number one, explain the Trinity. You're in trouble already. (laughs) The way you know you're going to go in is if you have received new life and a new birth from him. It's something that we cannot achieve but that God freely gives. Have you received that gift of new life from him? The question, who am I, is a terrifying question. Because if we're prepared to be honest about what's going on in our own hearts, the answer to that question is scary. Jesus Christ is the light. He is the truth. 
He came into this world to reveal things as they really are. But he didn't simply come here to reveal things as they are. He came to transform the way we are. That's what it means. If you are a Christian, you become his son or daughter. It gives you an identity that is secure in him that no one can take away. Where do you stand this evening? You know, my voice is failing and the tiredness is coming in. It's now about three o'clock in the morning for me back home. So I just want to ask you the question. Who are you? Is it possible that you're sitting here as a Christian and you've almost forsaken that Christian identity? You once knew who you were in Christ, but you've let it go. And you're now hopelessly confused. You need to put yourself back into his hands. Well, I'm going to ask you to do something which is very difficult. I know there's just a small group of you here, but if there are any of you here and you know you've been listening to this, that you've never received that new birth from Christ, you don't know who you are, but you know that you need to receive that new life from Christ, that new birth from him. He's the only one who can change you. Before I became a Christian, I had two great fears. Number one, if I became a Christian, life would become boring. The way I expressed it to a group of friends was I said, imagine life is like a swimming pool. Okay, I'm in the shallow end of the pool of life and I'm enjoying myself. I have, I'm having fun. I'm not bored. By asking me to become a Christian, you're asking me to get up, walk along the edge, jump into the deep end, and I don't even know if I can swim. Maybe I'll be eaten by sharks. I've always had a vivid imagination. And the person looking at me said, Michael, I've been in the deep end for 13 years, and I haven't drowned, and I haven't been eaten. But I can promise you this, if you stay in the shallow end of the pool of life, you'll only ever experience this much of it. Are you missing out on the plan that God has for you because you're determined to stay in the shallow end? The second fear I had was I didn't know who I was going to become. I wasn't sure if I could ever be good enough until someone sat me down and said, Michael, you still don't understand. You can never be good enough. You can only realize how bad you are and ask God to change you. Well, I went and found someone. I said, will you pray with me? Because I want to become a Christian. The next day, I saw one of my best friends. I didn't even say hello. They looked at me and they said, you're different. There's something different about you. What is it? Yeah, I said, I became a Christian yesterday. I said, what does that mean? I said, you know what? I'm not sure I can explain to you, but all I know is I'm changed through and through. I'm not the same person I was. I would like to offer to pray for anyone here who would like to give their life to Christ and know that new birth. If there is anyone there and you know that you need to receive this new birth from Christ, that today is the day, could I ask you just to stand where you are and I want to pray for you. It may be that you drifted away and you know that you need to put your hand firmly back in his. Can I pray? Okay, over there at the back. Would you guys mind coming forward so I can pray for you? Would you like to welcome them? And can we have some of the other team come forward? Come on, guys. Why don't you come up here? You've just experienced a life-changing event led by RZIM itinerant team member Michael Ramsden. If today's program inspired you, perhaps you'd like to hear the message in its entirety on CD. It's easy to place your order. Just call 1-800-448-6766. Again, the number is 1-800-448-6766. You can also order online at www.rzim.org. You can also write to RZIM at Post Office Box 921-939, Norcross, Georgia, 30010. Just Thinking is a listener-supported radio presentation of Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Tune in tomorrow for a new question and answer session that's sure to keep you on the edge of your seat. Until then, keep thinking. <laughs>